Okay, so I wanted to begin with this and thinking about how Jeremiah, what he's known as, he's known as the weeping prophet, right? And so I want us to, in that kind of filter, look to Jesus and him being the fulfillment of the weeping prophet, him being uh, the weeping prophet fulfilled and perfected simply because he could be. Um, Now, why is that? It is because he could solve the problem that Jeremiah weeped over, but Jeremiah couldn't fix himself. And so that's a filter through which I think we can see Jesus in Jeremiah, see the the aspects that Jeremiah brings out about Jesus, uh, God's word bringing out who Jesus is, what he does, ultimately driving us to the New Testament, driving us to his life, death, and resurrection. Um, But... But Jeremiah is often known as the weeping prophet. So even looking at all of the types of uh, the types of Jesus, the symbols of Jesus, the uh, the shadows of Jesus in the Old Testament text, that's one that we can really look at and how Jesus fulfills that. Jesus going into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. Uh, what does he do over Jerusalem? He weeps over them. He weeps over the covenant people of God and how they have, in their spiritual adultery, in their uh, blending of religions, in their unfaithfulness, he weeps over their condition. He weeps over who they are and their rejection of the Messiah that was Jesus himself. And so this helps us kind of, again, have a lens through which we can look through Jeremiah and see Jesus in all of Jeremiah. Um, the context of God's covenant people and Jesus weeping over them. But he's one who, like Jeremiah, is in despair in some way because Jeremiah is a human prophet. But Jesus is the perfect Messiah who can fix the problem that they that that Jeremiah weeps over. So um, with that in mind, we'll look at various texts Uh, to see this kind of come out, to see aspects of who Jesus is and what he does and seeing Jeremiah or Jesus in the book of Jeremiah. So go to Jeremiah 1, 5. And we'll basically go kind of in order. So we'll we'll be skipping around going chapter 1, chapter 2, and so on. Jeremiah 1, 5. This is a very well-known text. And so in these texts we ought to see how does this connect us to Christ? How does this give us a picture, again, of who Jesus is and his purpose in emptying himself and coming to be uh, the, the Lamb of God, to be the substitute for sinners? So it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, appointed you a prophet to the nations. And so how does this point us to Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who was intimately known by His Father before He was formed in the womb of Mary. And what the difference is, is Jesus is one in nature with God. And so He's not a created being. He is God Himself incarnate, God in the flesh. But we can get a picture of this as He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So Jesus was known by the Father before the foundation of the world. And he was the one who would come into human history, into his own creation, and do what they could not do, fix the problem that Jeremiah weeped over. And so we even see in the person of Jeremiah an arrow pointing to Christ. Even before you were born, I consecrated you. I set you apart for holy purposes. And Jesus being the substitute for sinners, Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, both Jew and Gentile. And so, again, Jesus was separated, consecrated for holy purposes. His holy purpose was to die for sinners, to stand in their place, to live righteously for them as as their substitute. So again, this language that is about Jeremiah... We can see it in the context of Jeremiah, but it should propel us to Jesus himself. This is all throughout all the prophets where there's layers of an immediate context, immediate historical context, or a context about a person like what we see here. 
But it doesn't stay there. It, it ought to drive us to Jesus as all the scriptures bear witness about him. So there's got to be a connection to Christ in one way or another. And so we see how Jesus was separated for the holy purposes of God and fulfilling his father's will and doing what we couldn't do as the, the sinless sacrifice. And he appointed, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was a prophet, but he was an imperfect prophet. Jesus was the prophet, the fulfillment of that office itself, and being the one true prophet. And so even in one text, even in just in the beginning words of Jeremiah, we can see Jesus come out to the foreground. If we are reading Scripture from that lens, through that lens, as we ought to in the Old Testament text, we can see Jesus very clearly. We can see how, how Scripture points to Jesus, brings us to who he is and what he does. That is the gospel itself, who Jesus is and his purpose for sinners like you and me who are lifeless, who are hopeless. And so Jesus, again, is, is, is seen in these texts. Go to Jeremiah 1, uh, 16 through 19. It says, And I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. But you dress yourself for work, arise, and say to them everything that I commanded that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I will make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Now again, this is a commission directly to Jeremiah. But how do we see Christ in this? What are some aspects in which we see Jesus very clearly? For one, right at the very end, this should be familiar to us. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you. What did Jesus say at the end of the Great Commission? For I am with you, even to the end of the age. And so this is a fulfillment in a lot of ways of the Great Commission of, G of, of God sending Jeremiah out. And so God's sending all of us out. Why? Because heaven, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ. And so therefore go. So we have a mission as God's people to go into the world to preach the gospel, make disciples, and command them to obey, to follow Jesus' teaching. And we are to not do that by ourselves. And so the weeping, the true weeping prophet that weeps over his people is the one who calls us out. And he's the one who is with us, who never forsakes us, and who actually calls people to himself through that gospel perfectly, graciously, and brings salvation to sinners who desperately need him. And so in that fulfillment of the Great Commission promise, him being with us, we can see Christ, can't we? We can see his faithfulness, his goodness in being with his people, no matter what will face him. And, and, and this commission with Jeremiah is, my goodness, just think about what he's going to get up against. Think about who he's going to have to confront. He says, Speak against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. And so this is not an easy task in any way. And if we know anything about the book of Jeremiah, it's going to be hardship left and right. And that's the way it is with, with going out into the world, isn't it? We're going against the grain. We're God's people who have God's message and the world doesn't want to hear it at all. And so we need to know that we have God not only on our side, but within us, who's never going to leave us, who is there with us, even to the end of the age, equipping us, strengthening us to keep moving forward with what we have, with what we've been entrusted. And so we see the fulfillment of the Great Commission promise as this points us to the one who fulfills that promise, Christ himself, who is with us. Also in this language of a fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls, this is essentially Jesus. Jesus is fought against by God's own people, the self-righteous people who are, who are rejecting him, who are turning away from him in their own self-righteousness. 
but none shall prevail against him. None shall prevail against his church, as he says in Matthew 16, 18. And so Jesus, nothing can destroy Christ. Nothing can, can prevail against him. And so even God's own people, even God's own covenant people, hung Jesus on the cross, brutally beat him, mocked him, killed him. They didn't prevail against him. And so that is the confidence that we, God's people, stand in. And knowing that, again, we can go out into all the world with his gospel that he's entrusted with us. And number one, he's going to be with us because of Christ. Number two, nothing can prevail. Nothing can defeat him. And so we go with great confidence, again, knowing that this is all fulfilled in Christ and in Christ alone. Go to chapter 2, verse 13. And I'll mention 17, verse 13 as well. You can just write that down. We won't go there. But Jeremiah 2, 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. This statement, or this phrase, the fountain of living waters, does that remind you of anything? Does that remind you of anything in the New Testament? Maybe Jesus and the woman at the well. Maybe Jesus in John 7, 37 through 38. See, these two instances bring out this language. Bring out this language of living water that comes from who? Christ. He is the fountain of living water. And so he is the fountain of living water as opposed to us who try to hold water but can't. We're broken cisterns. And this is especially connected to the self-righteous people of Israel, God's people who think that they are good by nature, who think that they can do good things, and they ought to. And so they try to do, but try to do righteous, but they're broken. They can't hold water. They can't sustain themselves, and they can't uh, do anything that is profitable in any way. They're religious but lost. See, the woman at the well was that same exact situation. She was a broken sister. And Jesus says, you need the living water that I give. And so even just in this simple little statement embedded in this verse right there, we can see Jesus in the book of Jeremiah. We can see Jesus, how he is the living waters that we need because we are those broken cisterns that do not hold water. And so we run to Christ knowing that he is the living water. Ultimately, this living water is the work of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit that he gives those people that he saves that he brings to life and now in that rebirth they have that living water flowing abundant water abundant life in the work of the holy spirit the holy spirit who does not fail again he, he can't he can't be prevailed he can't be destroyed he can't be um he can't be put down in any way and so again just a little phrase we can see christ in jeremiah Turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, and then 13 through 18. Chapter 4, verse 1. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from, your pre from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness... The nations shall bless themselves in him. In him. And in him they shall glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow, fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. O men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. So the nations shall bless themselves in him. It's Christ. It's Jesus himself. In him they shall glory. Because he is truth, he is justice, he is righteousness. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so this is a call to repentance. A call to repentance directed at God's covenant people who are turning their backs against their God 
who are straying away, who are following other idols, who are uh, committing spiritual adultery, who are blending religions with pagan nations, who are unfaithful in their own obedience to God's law. See, this should be a sign and in, in just a, a, a clear indication that they are utterly helpless, that they need Christ, that it's impossible for them to be faithful in and of themselves. But yet they strive, they try, they keep going, but they blend all of this pagan idolatry, all of this wickedness in and amongst their lives and the worship that they have, the worship that they come together in, and it's, it's, it's evil. It's evil deeds before God himself. It's filthy rags before God. And so this is a call for them to repent and to come to Christ, to be blessed in him, to give him glory. And so this is, again, Jesus in the book of Jeremiah. Here we see mercy and justice hand in hand. Here we see the mercy of God calling his people to circumcise and remove the foreskin of their hearts, to come and be made new. It's something that they cannot do. This is a number of places in the New Testament bring this out. Colossians 2.11, Romans 2.28-29. 2, it's about that, that, that circumcision of the heart that we need. We need the foreskin of our hearts to be removed, and we can't remove it ourselves. But they thought that they could. And so again, this points us to Jesus Christ being the one who can do this, who does do this. And that's where mercy is shown from God to sinners like you and me. And that at the same time, that's where justice is served to those who rebelled, to those who stay in their condition in rebellion against their God, against their Creator, against in this, these people of Israel, their covenant God. And so justice is served in Christ and mercy is given in Christ. And so we see these coexisting right here and we see mercy and justice collide in the cross, don't we? We have to see both of them. Honestly, look at both of them. Humbly look at the cross of Christ knowing that he is just in giving what we deserve. And also merciful in giving what we do not deserve. So again, these are instances where Jeremiah gives us a clear picture of Christ and Christ himself and his person and his work. Go to 5. Go to chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And also a connection here to chapter 10. We won't go there, but just write that down if you want to. Chapter 10, verses 23 through 24. But here, Jeremiah is commanded to go into the streets of Jerusalem. Listen to these words and listen to how they bring us to Jesus. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. Search your, her squares to see if you can find a man. One who does justice and seeks truth. That I may pardon her, pardon Jerusalem. Though they say, as the Lord lives, yet they swear falsely. O oh Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? You have struck them down, but they felt no anguish. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. Then I, then I said, these are only the poor. They have no sense. They do not know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. Hold on to that for a second. Verse 5, I will go to the great and will speak to them. For they know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. But they all alike had broken the yoke and they burst, they had burst the bonds. See, Jeremiah is to go out into Jerusalem. No, this is Jerusalem. This is God's people. This is the living place of God's people. He's not called to go some pagan nation. Go to my people. Go to where they live. And so he goes to the poor, who may logically might not know, 
But they do not know the way of the Lord, he says. The justice of their God. The righteousness of their God. Does that remind you of anything? Maybe what Paul says? This is the theme of his book in the letter to the Romans. Romans 1, 16 and 17. The gospel, what does it reveal? The righteousness from God. The righteousness that comes from God in Christ. That is what it reveals. So these poor people that he references, they have no sense. They don't know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. They don't know the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of the Messiah to come that they need to be clothed in. They don't know that. And so he is to find one person, anyone, who is that righteous, who, who does justice and seeks truth. That, he, that, that God may pardon Jerusalem. See, the person that he's supposed to find is supposed to act on behalf of God's people, right? Doesn't that remind you of anybody? One who's supposed to be a substitute, who stands in the place of God's people? This is Jesus. That God may pardon her. That God may pardon the church. Those that Jesus came for. And, but then he goes to the great. For they know the way of the Lord. They know the justice of their God. But they all alike had broken the yoke and had burst the bonds. They were just like the poor. And these were the ones who were great in the nation. And so this is a call to Jeremiah to go. And this is in the context of how we see him weeping. He's come to the conclusion over and over again and seeing their evil deeds saying, I can't find one. There is none. Paul says there's none who is good, none who is righteous, no, not one. This should drive us to the utter impossibility of our salvation in any effort of our own. Saying it's utterly impossible. We cannot obey God the way that we can. The way, or the way that we have to. The way that we're demanded to. Commanded to. And so it's utterly helpless. It's utterly impossible. Except for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. He is the one who again stands in the place of God's people so God can pardon his people. Isn't this amazing how we see just Jesus come out of this text of Jeremiah? How we see him very clearly. That just expands and magnifies the truth of God right here in front of us. Right here where we can see this whole plan laid out. Where we can see aspects of Jeremiah bringing out in, in, in the wickedness of God's people and that just drives us to the graciousness of Christ. How he was set before the foundation of the world to be that righteous one. To come and intervene into his creation. And again, do what we couldn't. That's utterly impossible for us to do. And so he is the only righteous one. Jesus himself, the son of God. And so there's great connection with Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 10, 1 through 4. That bring out the righteousness of God. The justice of God. Where he, God, was able to be just in Jesus. Because he punished Jesus. Jesus took the penalty so that we could be shown mercy. And this is all in the beautiful picture of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Where he lived the life that we had to live. He died the death that we deserve so that he could give that to us. And in exchange, our sins would be upon him. So that he would be clothed with our sin. Take it upon himself. So that we could be right before God. This text especially is one that just exudes Christ. And it's amazing to see how all the scriptures bear witness about Christ. Go to chapter 6 verse 21. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lay before this people stumbling blocks against with which they should stumble. Fathers and sons together, neighbors and friends shall perish. Stumbling block. Remind you of anywhere in the New Testament? 
Put your hand in Jeremiah for a minute and go to Romans 9. Because that little phrase, as we are in God's Word, studying God's Word, see it come about, should remind us, should, should perk us up and say, wait, I know where that talks about that. Romans 9.30 through 34 through 33 there's not a 34 the 33 what shall we say then the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it that is a righteousness that is by faith but that Israel who pursued a, a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law why because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a, stumble, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 8. And this is where we see the Old Test or the New Testament just bringing a more fullness to God's word. In just one little phrase, a stumbling stone, stumbling block, we see it magnified, clarified, as is now it's revealed. So second, First Peter two, one through eight. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the spiritual milk. That by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted the, that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. See, here we even see a connection back to Jeremiah 1.5, don't we? Chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, a stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So here we see... A great connection in just one phrase, stumbling stone, stumbling rock. Pointing to Christ. Pointing to Jesus being the one that God's covenant people stumbled over. Because they saw righteousness in themselves. They could not see the righteousness from Christ. They were ignorant of that. So they established their own righteousness. So here again we see Jesus in Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah 9. Nine twenty three and twenty four. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let, that, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Hold on to that me for a minute. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Go to 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1, verse 31. verse 30. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, so Jesus became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that 
as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So when Jeremiah says, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, who's the me ultimately referring to? It's referring to Christ. It's referring to God's people knowing Jesus. Knowing who he is and what he's done as their personal Savior, their Lord, their Master, their Redeemer, their Deliverer, their Righteous One who stood in their place. And so even just this little phrase, boast that he understands and knows me, as we hear in the Old Testament, should connect us to the New Testament testimony of Jesus Christ, this being Jesus Christ. This is said as well in 2 Corinthians 10, 17. So just reference that later. But it's just the same language. So we ought to boast in knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because he's the fulfillment of Jeremiah. He's that weeping prophet who can actually fix our problem. And that is beautiful. That's beautiful. And as we connect this even to this topic of knowing Jesus. Go to Jeremiah 23. This is a, one of the more well-known texts that point to Christ. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6. And as we get to the end of verse 6, remember what we just heard in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a branch, a righteous branch. And he, he, who is he? Jesus. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. What did 1 Corinthians 1.30 just say? The Lord is our righteousness. Right? He's our righteousness. Sanctification and redemption. He became to us those things. He was our substitute in those ways. Righteous. The only one righteous. The only one who could. Sanctification being holy, set apart. And redemption, delivering us from our very own sin, the power of our sin that enslaved us, entangled us. So Jesus is the Lord, our righteousness, that Jeremiah is talking about. And this here is the same language we hear in Jeremiah 33. You don't need to turn there, but you can maybe write that down. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 18, same language. Again, the testimony of Jeremiah is pointing us to Christ and pointing us to him in many different ways, many different aspects. Jesus being the fountain of living waters. Jesus being the justice of their God. Jesus being the stumbling block. Jesus being the one that was known intimately in the womb before he was formed. The one true prophet that was to come, God himself, God in the flesh. All of these give us a great picture as we put them together of Christ and Him crucified. Who Jesus was and what He came to do. A couple more in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25. Now what needed to happen, many things, but as we hear here, you will catch on. What needed to happen for our sins to be forgiven, for, for the judgment to be taken away. Jeremiah 25, 15 through 29. And thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. For the sake of time, we won't go through the rest of it. But turn to John 19. 
What did Jesus drink? What did he drink and who did he do it for? John chapter 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour, sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up his spirit. See, he drank God, the cup of God's wrath so that we wouldn't have to. So here in Jeremiah, these people were made to drink the cup of God's wrath. That's the point as to Christ, who did it for us. Who stood on our place and took and drank God's wrath was the sponge who soaked up God's wrath so that we would not have God's wrath abiding on us for eternity. So it would be wiped away. So that great dark cloud that's hanging over us in our sin would be taken away by Christ. It would be gone the judgment of God would be taken away. And so in this language that's being brought out in Jeremiah, again, we ought to see Christ in it. And if we don't, then we're doing a great disservice to ourselves, to the church, to what the scriptures bear about the Son of God. We ought to read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ connected to him in every way that we see him exalted and brought to the foreground. And the pinnacle of this ultimately is Jeremiah 31. This is our last text. Go there. Because this is essentially answering the problem of what we started with. Jeremiah was weeping. He was the weeping prophet over God's people. He was in despair because there was no one righteous. No, not one. He couldn't find anybody. No one can do what God was calling them to do in in utter faithfulness and complete faithfulness. So he was, in a way, in despair and weeping over the condition and the wickedness that kept coming out from these people who claimed to know God, who claimed to be faithful, but weren't at all. And so one of the great Old Testament texts that points us to how that whole problem was solved is here Jeremiah 31 verse 31 through 40 or 31 through 34 behold the days are coming declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt my covenant that they broke though I was their husband declares the Lord For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days declares the Lord I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more from the poor to the great sinners in all spectrums of life will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of his saving work on their behalf and guess what will be written on their heart? The law. The new path in Christ that we ought to obey God's law. We ought to be in submission to God's law and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's written on our hearts and the Holy Spirit brings that out. A desire to follow. A desire to live according to the commandments of God and in that We show that we love him. And so this is the new covenant. Focusing on Christ and how he fulfills that new covenant. Ultimately, that's bringing in the Gentiles. As we know, that's that's a great picture all throughout the scriptures. But it's a new covenant in Christ. So he is the one who could fix the problem. So he's not only weeping over Jerusalem, but he's weeping as the son of God, knowing what he's going to do. The two natures in Christ we see beautifully in him weeping, yet him being the one who takes away our tears. The one who stands in our place. 
So as we've just kind of barely scratched the surface of looking at various texts in Jeremiah, I hope you see how clearly Jesus comes out in these texts, how clearly Old Testament gives us Christ, shows us the radiance and beauty of who he is and, and, and what he's done. Going through all of these aspects, all of these statements that are ultimately drawn out more clearly in the New Testament, and that's in the context of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so see, Jerem see Jesus and Jeremiah more clearly. Study these texts more. Ponder on them. Meditate on them. And, and look at everywhere, everywhere else that they are connected to in the scriptures. Study the Old Testament with a gospel lens, with a Jesus filter. And connect it to the saving work of Christ. So we see him more throughout all the scriptures. We ought to not unhinge the old with the new. If we do, that's disastrous. We have to see Jesus through the whole thing. As God reveals his son. The perfect righteous one. So with that, hopefully you see Jesus more in Jeremiah. And hopefully that drives you to God's word for more study. Let's pray.